Dignity Unbound is about one big goal, ending poverty worldwide. In this way, we are taking a stand for human dignity. I'm Matt Warner, president of Atlas Network, where I lead our project, Dignity Unbound. We partner with 500 local nonprofits in nearly 100 countries. These are the groups that are working to transform economic opportunity because they know what works in their community. These are stories about people making a difference at the local level. They will inspire you with optimism, even in the midst of our global crisis. I invite you to check out some of our stories of success. These are not stories about poor people. These are about people of great dignity who are working to lift the communities in which they live. Positive change is possible. Will you help end global poverty? Will you join the human dignity revolution? Welcome to the world premiere of the short documentary, Education Reimagined. After the movie, there will be a live Q&A. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this great story from the heart of West Virginia. If you wanted to turn West Virginia into an economic backwater, you would try to implement the education results that we've seen. Despite spending pure pupil above the national average, despite a national per capita income being well below the national average, our test results were terrible. And unfortunately, that's why we are where we are as a state. We're trying to reform the system, not for some abstraction. We're trying to reform it for families. People don't realize that how West Virginia could be the place to change America. I think it's important to try to innovate and to reimagine, reengineer, and redesign the current system. We have to have that education back. Without that, we're not a free people. Matthew J. Watts. I'm the senior pastor and teacher of the Grace Bible Church of Charleston, and I've been pastoring here for the last uh, 25 years. I'm a native of West Virginia, and I've lived all but two of my 64 years in the state of West Virginia. I physically live on the west side of Charleston. My church is located on the west side of Charleston. Um, it is viewed as one of the worst neighborhoods in West Virginia in terms of the crime rate, uh, the poverty rate, uh, slum and blighted conditions, poor performing schools, particularly at the elementary uh, school level. Suspension may be the single most significant factor that drives children from the schoolyard to the prison yard pipeline, and that every suspension moves them in that direction. I think West Virginia and maybe Appalachia kind of writ large is one of the last places that you can really make fun of. You know, we are sort of a, we're a late night comedian punchline. That hurts, it really does. My name is Jennifer White. My husband is Brian. We live in Barbersville, West Virginia. We have uh, three kids. Ethan, when he was little, he was always ready to go anywhere, all the time. When we started public school, it, it got a little tough. As he got older, we thought, well, you know, first grade, he, he's not having a good time with reading. So we started to investigate different options and had him evaluated and he had moderate dyslexia. Okay. Very dyslexia good. is a lot of things. It's very complicated and it manifests in different people different ways. It's surprisingly so common, but it's at the same time, a lot of the educators, they, they're just not trained, so they just don't speak on it and they don't really know. Education really touches everybody. It touches the rich, the middle class, the poor class, working class, it doesn't really matter. And to the extent that that mechanism is broken, then I think we begin to understand why other segments of society are broken right along with it. 
So when Cardinal got started, the education landscape in West Virginia was frankly desert-like. I mean, if, if you want to use that sort of analogy. We were one of the few states in the country that did not have any form of school choice, uh, whether that was charter schools or private school choice programs like education savings accounts. We found that there has been a, a huge discrepancy in discipline and suspension, particularly of, of African American children versus everyone else. What was the most alarming and disturbing is that it's just simply been ignored by the leaders at the state level and even the county level. So what happens, suspension, you know, it drives absences for a lot of students. And that means they're missing academic instruction. Well, suspension also drives truancy because those suspended days are unexcused absences. Truancy is the number one factor that brings children in West Virginia into the juvenile justice system. We think that this may be the valve. If you put your hand on this suspension line, we keep kids in school and connected, then we got a chance to maybe they will have a better educational outcome. I think the status quo in West Virginia, and this is not just in education, but everywhere, is that one size fits all. And that is not the case. Everybody's kids are different. And I think to the extent that we can design an education system that recognizes that and allows us to complement strengths and build up weaknesses, that's a very good thing. And there are some children that are overwhelmed. They've been abused, they've been neglected. They, they're not motivated to learn. They're greatly discouraged. Their spirit has been crushed. And they create problems in the school for the other students that want to learn. But most of them are still trying. You can feel ashamed. You can feel isolated and lost. And it is really, really, really sad. It's a desperate feeling because you can't help it. They can't help it. It's just, it's just where they are, and they just need a special approach. All right, you ready? Yep. yep, let's go. All right, let's do it. Basically what it's like to have dyslexia. If you're reading a sentence, and there's one minute little word that you change out, I guess that's what it would be like, or kind of, replacing the sentence and saying it a different way. Good job, baby. Good work. You switch letters and words around in a sentence or almost completely change the sentence entirely. I knew tons of families that had kids with dyslexia. It, it sort of became a, a mission for me that we truly need an army of tutors to address this. We need we need to highlight the issues and the lack of tutoring in the area, especially here, but truly all around the country, there's a lack of the service for kids. I now have three students outside of my own three kids. Innovation is fundamentally about discovering what works. And so what does that look like? That looks like Jennifer's tutoring service that she has set up to tutor dyslexic students in her neighborhood in her city. Uh, it may look like Reverend Watts in the battles that he's fought for decades to look at different types of disciplinary problems that we see in West Virginia's African-American neighborhoods vis-a-vis -vis white neighborhoods or poor neighborhoods and perhaps wealthier neighborhoods. And to the extent that you put a lid on innovation, and as it relates to education, you're putting a lid on potential. We have to have an above all solution. We have to let a million flowers bloom. I believe that we need a menu of options that communities and that parents you can select from. I believe that if we have a model that allows flexibility at the local level. A model that empowers a local governing body. A model that gives that principal the authority that he or she needs that engages parents and engages the entire community. I think that the current system can be changed. Every kid is different. Every kid learns in a different way. And they deserve to have their needs met in the way that they need it. We got 685 schools. There are 270,000 children that are in those schools. So we need to do something that creates a model and a template that could uh, be the game changer for those 685 schools. They deserve better leadership. I still believe that change can and will happen. 
So we'll keep fighting on. inspiring documentary i want to first uh thank uh thatch films charlie fritchner and oj skiera uh as well as uh, joe jensen with iron light for uh this presentation and this opportunity to have this conversation i was uh really encouraged to see the, the diversity of, of countries and states and cities around the world joining us today um, and i want to tell you a little bit about the conversation that you're joining right now, which is, as you saw in the film, uh, an opportunity to hear from local voices. Dignity Unbound is about reaching out and raising up local voices because local knowledge is so important. And as you heard also from the uh, film, the opportunity is to learn about a about variety, variety of different, of different perspectives, perspectives and to make sure that those are brought there on, on the, future the future that we're, that we're doing. Um, um, let me let share with the team that I'm here. I'm here. If it's just, 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 just me, then I can get through it. Okay, I think that's gone away now. Um, uh, I'm Matt Warner with Dignity Unbound. Let me also introduce Casey Pfeiffer in the bottom left of your screen. She will be serving as uh, monitor for questions that you may have, which you can submit in the chat at any time. And uh, this is an opportunity to learn more from two of our um, uh, esteemed presenters from the short documentary you just saw. And then I also want to acknowledge that Jennifer White, who was also featured in the documentary, has joined us uh, today in the audience. And so we thank her for being part of this. Uh, Reverend, let me first turn to you um, and invite you to share with us a little bit more about your experience as someone who, in your position, you have such an intimate understanding of your community and the people that you're trying to serve. Uh, what is it that you think uh, people maybe on the outside or from the ivory tower trying to push policy, what is it that you want them to understand about the, the people in your community and the potential you see? Yeah, thanks back for that question, and thanks for having me here uh, on this uh, broadcast. One of the first things that I would like them to understand is to understand that we understand the commitment being made in West Virginia. There are some incredibly positive things happening in West Virginia. There's a tremendous commitment to public education from our legislature and the executive branch of government. And we have a large expenditure of nearly $3 billion annually on public education. Uh, we have a an incredible preschool program we recognized nationally. In fact, we have universal pre k available to all four year olds. We have one of the nation's highest graduation rates. Uh, so, there are very positive things that's happening. But I don't think that our leadership in the state, county boards, and the legislature, and governor's office understand a community like the west side of Charleston, which has a high rate of, of poverty, a high concentration of African Americans, is a community with a vision. The people want their children to be educated. They have tremendous passion. Uh, they have resiliency. They're hardworking people. And people assume that they're, they're slothful, uh, that they are really not motivated. Uh, we are a community of the working poor. We have to drive the economy of this capital city. Our people cross those bridges every morning to go to the hotels and the restaurants and the hospitals where they work in laundry and housekeeping and dietary, et cetera. We have a tremendous percentage of our people that are the essential workers that we're now starting to recognize. And even some of the people on the streets uh, that are addicted to substance issues, there's not a day to go by that they don't stop me and say, Reverend White, do you have any work that I can do? There's a tremendous commitment here that you want to work. And then lastly, I don't think they understand that our children, like many children in poor communities, they face some incredible challenges every day. 
where there's domestic violence, child abuse and neglect, the drug trafficking that is taking place, slum and blighted housing, but most of them still have a twinkle in their eye. And most of them get up every morning and they go to school and they're putting forth an effort uh, to learn. And I don't think that that's really appreciated. And then lastly, I don't think that the staff have recognized that many of us in this community that we're not sitting in judgment. We believe that teachers are working hard, principals are working hard, that everyone's in certain what they're trying to do. So we're not in sitting in judgment of them. And I tell them often that the test scores that our children uh, basically produce annually, it's not a record of the public school alone. It's, our, it's my test score. It's community's test score that we're in this together. And I don't think they fully appreciate our commitment to supporting public education because 99.9% of us who live in this neighborhood, we are product of the public school system. And we are getting respect for and great appreciation when it gets to us. We recognize, as you've said before, that this has to stay about students. And uh, I think there's always the temptation um, in some of these discussions uh, to stay in this place of adults fighting each other about their own opinions, etc. And the message of this film is let's let's open it up and give local uh, vision uh, an opportunity. Now you have identified uh, one of the key issues from your perspective is some of this dis disparate treatment in terms of di discipline. And as I understand it, there has been some progress uh, thanks to your work and, and, and others in the, in the area. Tell us a little bit about the progress that has been made in, and, and uh, how you see potentially um, fulfilling the, uh, the goals that you have. Well, first of all, I do not believe that most Americans understand how significant the problem of excessive discipline, suspension, expulsion is for students, particularly African-American children and low-income white children and Latinx children. There are three and a half million children suspended from public schools in the United States every single year. And the 13 southern states that West Virginia is a part of, that for the 13 southern states, we account for 55% of all African-American children suspended from school in the United States of America. The reason it's so significant is the suspension, as I try to articulate in the documentary, uh, it contributes to truancy. It contributes to uh, the education achievement gap, kids missing instruction, brain kids in the juvenile justice system. And it is the first step from the school yard to the prison yard pipeline. And I don't think that's really fully understood and really appreciated. And so we, for the last five years, have been trying to bring this attention to the attention of our state school board, our state superintendent's office, and our legislature. And unfortunately, we think they've heard us, but they haven't heard us. And the reason they haven't heard us, the things become normalized. By that I mean that when it comes to poor people in general, and black people in particular, there can be a pathology that people will accept as it being normal. And because it's being normal, no one then digs into it and do the big dive to determine should this be happening. So we try to bring that attention to West Virginians. Since 90% of all students I put to is our low our white children, and the majority of children that have been suspended are low income white children, even though African Americans are suspended twice the rate. We're trying to bring attention to the fact that the suspension thing it is the trigger. It is the first step, and it's why our prison population continues to grow, even though we have a low crime rate, and even though we have a, uh, our population is declining overall. So that's some of the things we're trying to bring about. So finally this year, and uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And so we're able to get the legislature to pass a very modest bill, uh, Senate Bill 723, that will require the state board to review all the disciplinary data and then come back in two years, in 2022, and give a report. And we thought that was somewhat offensive, that they would give it two years when we have been uh, talking about this for five years, and all the data is already present. But we're hopeful that maybe uh, this documentary will not only spur this conversation uh, to a deeper level in the state of West Virginia, but all around the country. This is not a pathology that is unique uh, to the wonderful mountain state. It is a national problem. So much so that 16 states, I believe, have taken action 
to pass legislation to limit what the public school can suspend a child from school for. That's how serious that some recognize the problem really is. And so we're hopeful that maybe our state will come to realize that and take some more aggressive actions during the 2020 legislative session to move this issue forward. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, I'll remind everyone that you can post your questions in the chat and we will get to the Q&A portion of the uh, program here shortly. Um, let me turn to Garrett uh, Ballengy, who heads the Cardinal Institute in West Virginia. Um, uh, now, your organization is uh, relatively new. Uh, you can tell us a little bit more about you, your history, but you've you, you established your, your organization with an eye to um, seeing increased economic opportunity in West Virginia. And uh, tell us a little bit about why education policy in particular has has um, become such a, a big focus for you. Sure. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for hosting this documentary. This is a really cool format. And I see we have over a thousand people watching from Venezuela to Croatia. So this is a very good feeling. It's never an enviable position to follow Reverend Watts, but I will. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think there are a couple different reasons why Cardinal decided to focus on education policy early on. Uh, perhaps at a, at a high level, education is foundation, foundational to the classical liberal sensibilities, things like free speech, things like freedom of association, things like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the primacy of the individual. Um, these are all inextricably linked to education. And to the extent that the children aren't getting an education, then our, our society, frankly, is at risk, not to be hyperbolic about it. Um, and so I think that was something that we identified really, really early on was our kids gonna, getting a good education either at the aggregate level or at the individual level. So that is kind of why we got started at a high level um, on education. And at a, at, a, at a kind of a micro level, I think we all understand that all kids are different. All kids have different learning needs, different learning styles, different interests, uh, weaknesses, strengths. And so although the, the current education system perhaps was, was good uh, for the society within which it was developed in the early 20th century, 19th century, I don't really think that's the case anymore. And so now through the power of the technology, through the power of just a wealthy society like the United States is, we're able to adapt our system. We're able to recognize the fact that different kids have different learning needs. And so utmost flexibility and the ability to customize an education, I think is really kind of an education frontier. And Cardinal recognized this. And so, you know, you look across the rest of the United States and so many other states, millions of families have opportunities to create a customizable education, to give their kids the opportunity to, opportunity to receive an education that they feel like best suits their child's needs. And we didn't really have that here in West Virginia, and it's still limited to an extent. Perhaps we'll get into that, into that later. But we thought on just a basic fairness level, we need to give West Virginia's families the same opportunities that families across the United States have. So perhaps that's from a micro level and a macro level why we got, it, got into it. And so tell us a little bit about what we can uh, expect to see next from the Cardinal Institute. Um, especially as it relates to you know you uh, getting to know Re reverend watts and the opportunity to get a lot of uh new perspectives into the conversation related to uh policy that that you're looking at what what can we expect to see and what gives you optimism over the next 12 24 36 months I'm smiling because optimism in 2020 are not common bedfellows. Uh, <laughs> I guess I can say of, either in spite of or because of the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Cardinal is, is famous or rather infamous for working on the school choice issue. And I'm, I'm going to say we're not going away. Um, we're going to continue to advocate on behalf of West Virginia's families and children. It will continue to be our number one issue for the foreseeable future. And so I think capitalizing on recent successes that we've seen, whether that's open enrollment and charter schools, continuing to advocate for perhaps what I'm most excited about, which is education savings accounts. Again, all with the idea that we need to place kids at the center of this debate. And I think sometimes it's so easy to get that back. Um, 
and I think also too, it's important to realize for for reformers of the education system in general, you never know where allies are going to come from. I think in our society today, when everything is so highly politicized and polarized, we tend to just camp out with our respective tribe. And I think that is a, a huge mistake. And so actually Reverend Watts reached out to me, I don't know if he remembers this, but about a year and a half ago, as a result of an op-ed that I had written on how school choice or the lack of school choice perpetuates inequality. And so he reached out in response to that op-ed and we've been able to form a conversation ever since that, that, initial, that initial moment that we talked to one another. And if it, if it wasn't for school choice, I mean, frankly, Reverend Watts and I probably unfortunately would have never met one another. Right. And so I think that's that's something to keep in mind. You never know where allies are going to come from. And even though Reverend Watts is coming at it from a from a school discipline, prison uh, schoolyard to prison pipeline perspective, and we're coming at it more from a flexibility and customization perspective, there are a lot of similarities there and a problem we're facing the size of the current status quo. Yeah. And as you said, there are some positive things, certainly as well. But reform has to come within the system and it has to come from without, from around the system. And so I think that's important for folks to, to understand and respect as well. Um, thank you so much, Garrett. Uh, Reverend Watts, any uh, final uh, comment in response to what Garrett said before we open it up to Q&A to the audience? A couple of things I would like to say is that I am a product of the public school system. My younger sister, Dr. Ollie Watts Davis, is watching from Sanford, Illinois. And, uh, our five children were educated in public school. Uh, I started school segregation, public school work in 1964. The W. Bush Elementary School, at the end of the paid road, a four year school, four room building on the side of the mountain. I had three grammar school teachers uh, Gladys Wheeler, Frankie Anderson, and uh, the greatest of all, uh, Miss Ailey's Watson. And I did not know that they were brilliant, but they were geniuses. And I didn't know the education that I received until I got to college. And I never had better instruction all through my academic experience than what I had at W. E. B. Board, a segregated school at the end of the paved road. I know what education can produce when there is a commitment from teachers, from parents, from the entire community to every child being educated to the highest level. I'm a public school advocate. I believe that the public school system in America is, has been a genius of an institution. I believe that it has been the greatest single public experiment in the history of the United States of America because the public school system produced the workforce to create the world's greatest economy. The public school system produced the workforce to create, create the greatest military, the greatest technology. It took us from horse and buggy to going to and from the moon. The public school system produced the society. So herein lies the problem. In my opinion, the public schools have been so magnificently successful to produce a society so well educated that the society basically exceeded the capacity of the public school. I don't think the schools need to be reformed. I think words matter. Reform means somebody's done something wrong. Juvenile delinquents need to be reformed, prison need to be reformed. The public schools have done nothing wrong to be magnificently successful, but they have become somewhat antiquated because society has changed so much. I like to say the schools need to be reimagined. They need to be re-engineered and they need to be redesigned. And the people at the local community level basically need to be able to participate in the reimagination, redesign and re-engineering because the school needs to be customized for the context in which it, it, it exists and resides with a group of students and a group of parents. And the current system does not allow that. Last I say this, for 20 years, I've been involved in trying to participate in poor education conversation. There's no place for the public. I've been stiff on. I've just been in every education reform initiative. But we're often stiff on by the legislators, by the teachers association, and by the state school and the county school board. They think they are the experts. And I respond to that, that you are. You are the experts for the current system. And you might know how to run this current system. But this current system it's inefficient. It's inadequate. It can't take us where we need to go. So we need ideas coming from other places rather than those individuals that's in this echo chamber just talking to each other. And we cannot allow us to be totally polarized, uh, like we are in West Virginia, between the uh, charter school people and the people that maintain things as they are. 
And so I'd like to share at some point uh, with our listeners on uh, our virtual media that we actually wrote a plan for education reform. Now, we didn't talk about discipline and suspension. We've written several pieces of legislation uh, that we believe were uh, better probably than what we've actually passed in terms of creating a real community option to public education and need the legislature, the governor's office, nor the state school or the state superintendent office to even acknowledge to the public they have received a, a, a viable uh, alternative what was being postulated, even though in private meetings with the uh, Senate president and other legislators, they agreed that our idea had merit. So we plan to come back to the table this year, and I look forward to working with Garrett uh, and others to have this conversation, because this will require some of us who come from different perspectives, we distill out the best ideas. And that's what everybody seems to be afraid of right now. Mm -hmm. No one wants to realize that maybe our idea is not the civil book. And maybe there needs to be somewhat of a meshing together uh, to get a right idea. So we'll continue to stay in the conversation and look forward to work with Garrett and Carmen in the future. Well, I want to thank you both for your example and your leadership in demonstrating what I think needs to be the future of this conversation, which is not about, um, you know, a very divisive, uh, hostile uh, protection of power. I mean, we've got to get past all that. This is about the students and the good ideas can come from from anywhere. And from the perspective of Dignity Unbound and our philosophy, uh, they they often come from the bottom up, from the local communities themselves who see and have ideas for how things could uh, adapt and change as as, uh, as we move into the future. So thank you to both of you for showing uh, what I hope is the future of, of these conversations. Let's turn now to Casey and invite her to... Uh, Share with us. I'll also point out that Casey is a is a native of of, of West Virginia, um, and she's on our team here at, at Dignity Unbound. Uh, so, Casey, please take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Garrett and uh, Reverend Watts. I, uh, as Matt said, I can't say um, a personal thank you enough for you know my sisters are still in the school system in West Virginia. So it's an amazing work you're doing. So we've got a lot of energy in the chat. And something that I want to jump right into is that we have some, you know, sort of some skepticism about charter schools and school choice being able to adequately address the uh, challenges that face minorities in schools in West Virginia and broadly across the country. Um, you know, questions about the quality, the certification requirements for charter schools. Uh, maybe that you know, the idea that maybe that's taking resources away from the public school system that Reverend Watts talks so eloquently about. So what would you say to respond to questions and some skepticism on that? And Reverend Watts, if you could just talk a little bit more about, you know, we're talking about a menu, right? So it's not just charter schools. This is one option of many. So um, maybe we'll start with uh, Reverend Watts and then we can see if Garrett has another comment as well. Well, basically, what we have postulated was that all of the West Virginia codes of the Section 18 through 12 of the Community Development School Pilot Program, which we were involved in back in 2010, actually, until Master Third was the governor, and he was trying to advance the charter schools, and it was unable to get passed, but they accepted our idea. The idea behind the Community Development School Pilot Program is similar to a charter school in that we said we would like a local governing board. We would like these schools governed by people from the local community. Hey guys, can you hear me? I can't. I can't hear yeah. anything. So if, if there was a question that was asked to me, I apologize. Uh, we can hear you, um, but uh, the question uh, Rev Reverend Watts is now answering. So, so, so this is many what we are saying that, as I said in the document, we have 685 schools in this right? So adding three, five, ten, fifteen, twenty schools is not going really to change the dynamic of the education. We're concerned about the existing schools. And how do we work with principals and teachers and through those schools? So a pilot, let's say, let's let a local community group of people that are appointed by the local board, let them manage their school. Let the local board serve as consultants to provide a technical system. Let the state board serve as being uh, the education research think tank, identifying bad practices. So we believe that if people are accountable for the children in their community, and they're held accountable for the performance of schools. 
they will figure it out because they have invested interest in moving forward and they can be held accountable in ways that you can't hold the system accountable now. I, I close with this on this point. Is that the schools really are managed by rules and regulations and policies. That's what manages the school. In our county, in Kenora County, uh, we have, uh, I think, 42 elementary schools, 14 middle schools, and eight high schools, right? And so you can do that math. We've got 60-some schools. How can one group of people in a central office manage those schools? It's really impossible. And the schools are not being effectively managed the way they need to be managed, not because principals are not dedicated to to doing it, but in many cases, they don't have the leeway and effective flexibility to do what they know needs to be done based on the population of kids walking walk through their door every day and the parents in the community where they reside. So that's what that's the type of flexibility we would like to see on the menu. We don't believe we have to divorce ourselves from the current public school system. We think we can become a, remain a part of it. But right now, the public only goes in public education in West Virginia is through the LSIC, the local school and school council. But in most cases, it's just a rubber stamp of what the principal wants to do, it could be beefed up where there's more involvement of from the community. But we want the public to be put back in public school. And we want uh, an opportunity to demonstrate that the local governing body, of people from that neighborhood that know the kids, the parents, the neighborhood best, may be able to manage a school more effectively than what can be managed by a group of people that commute in every day and are really not connected to the community because they no longer live or reside there. And the real relationship with the children in the school, which we, are, which we appreciate, we don't think we should get what we need to get with the current model. Thanks so much, Reverend Watts. Uh, Garrett, I think because we can hear him, maybe he wants to respond here. Hey, can you, can you still, still hear me? Okay, good. I apologize if this is somewhat disjointed. All of a sudden, my my mic just stopped working, so I can't hear anyone. Um, so in case you can answer your question, how would I respond to, to skeptics? I would say this, have an open mind. There are 3 million people in charter schools, not to necessarily make this about charter schools, but there are 3 million kids across this country that have their kids in charter schools, and they work fantastically for a lot of people. And so I, I think that we have to get beyond labels on certain things. We have to get beyond the idea that we have to work within this current system. I, I think we have to be a little bit more kind of future oriented and a little bit more open minded on just trying something out. I think the beauty of charter schools, just as an example, if they don't work, they can shut down. And we have to be able to test, we have to be able to discover, we have to be able to innovate what is going to work for a, a particular community. We know that right now in West Virginia, there are tens of thousands of kids who aren't being served well, perhaps through no fault of the current system at all. Maybe there's a bully issue. Maybe there's just a certain teaching style that a kid is not prospering and learning as well as he could be under. And so I think we have a moral obligation as a state and a society to try to innovate beyond that instead of just trying to figure out how do we how do we work the system currently. I think sometimes we forget that, you know, the amount of time that we hope to to reform the current system, three, four, five, six years, that's half of the educational journey of, of a child. And so I, you know, whether charter schools, ESAs, magnet schools, community schools, which Reverend Watts has talked so eloquently about in the past. Let's try them all out. And the ones, the beauty of the system or the beauty of the market in this regard, the ones that do not work will be shut down. And the ones that will earliest identify what is working for their child or what isn't working for their child is the family. And I think at the end of the day, if we can place trust within the family unit, within the community, we're going to figure out really quickly what works and what doesn't work and we'll be able to, to move beyond that point. That's a really uh, helpful response, Garrett. I think it speaks to one of your, my favorite quotes of yours in the film, which is, we have to let a million flowers bloom, right? Um, and it's really an important piece of all of this. So I wanted to come back to um, the question of kind of disciplinary justice and how that ties in with school choice. So, you know, um, so one of our question, uh, one of our um, attendees asked, you know, 
how do we face problems with minority dis disciplinary justice, but also um, the disproportionate amount that they're uh, sort of deemed special education requirements and given, you know, deemed as ADHD and things like this. So Reverend Watts, how does school choice tie in with these issues that you're so such a passionate advocate for? That's why I believe that so strongly that uh, if we're going to move uh, beyond where we are now, you have to have more involvement at the local level. And that's why being a local government board where parents are actually uh, encouraged to actually engage. Reverend, can I ask office. you to speak a little bit louder? Yes. Uh, what, what I'm suggesting is that uh, that's why we need this idea of local governance of schools. And not necessarily have to make them charter schools, but have the local governments to really engage people in a meaningful way to be a part of the solution and the management of the school. We've got to recognize that we have 401 years of bias against black people, and that it is woven into the fabric of every system and every institution, and it's become normalized. I don't believe that teachers and parents and principals come to school with a clandestine, premeditated plan, right? to expel and discipline and suspend black children from school. But because the system is such that it's normal for it to happen and no one recognizes it as being abnormal. Quickly, let me explain to you what I mean. So no one's been talking, we haven't been talking as aggressively as we should about this suspension expulsion pandemic around the country among black children, other minorities, and low-income white children because it's normal. You go to the juvenile justice system, West Virginia has been cited and sanctioned by the United States Department of Justice for disproportionate minority contact, over representation of blacks in every stage of the juvenile justice system, arrest, detention, adjudication, delinquency, transfer to adult status. But it's become normalized. Blacks are overrepresented in the prison system, it is normalized. Even when there's research and data that says there's no reason that blacks should be suspended from school in the juvenile justice system or in prison at the race that they are, other than the bias of the system. And one salient point that came up a few years ago when a friend of mine, Dr. Stephen Haas, did a study where they looked at 31,400 traffic stops in the state of West Virginia. And it was all documented, the race of the, uh, the person stopped. And here's what the data showed. The blacks are stopped, they are ticketed, and they are searched at a much higher rate than whites. But when stopped, ticketed and searched at a higher rate, they've been found to have drugs and contraband at a lower rate. This bias against black people is pervasive across every system, but there's also a bias against low-income whites in West Virginia that people don't want to talk about because they are suspended and disciplined and so forth at, at, at much higher rate than their non-low-income uh, white counterpart. Accountability is the, uh, it's what is necessary and a, a, a real scrutiny of the data uh, and the information so that people can see what's actually happened. And what we're accepting is normal is to strong in this state because we have one of the highest incarceration rates in the United States of America, one of the lowest crime rates, and one of two states with a declining population. So why are we incarcerating people, people at such high rates? Well, right. not incarcerated is not higher than that are low-income whites. Because 85% of everybody in West Virginia prisons are white people, poor. Blacks own 3.4% of the population, but there are 12% of those incarcerated disproportionate. It's about race, it's about class. In this country, it's always been about race, and it's always been about class. But in the one system that's supposed to, that's supposed to be the, uh, the elevator, the public school system, it has now become a system basically that's sending kids from the schoolyard to the prison yard if they're black and if they're white poor, and everybody's accepting it as it's being normal. And I'm crying yeah. from the world because this is abnormal. We continue to have the lowest labor force participation rate. We continue to be one of the poorest states in the union. We continue to be one of the most unhealthy states in the union if we continue to push poor children out of the public school. Absolutely. So that's, that's why this is so serious and so critical, right? It's at the heart of what's happening right now, I believe, in our state and in many places around the country. Thanks so much, Reverend Watts. Well, we are running out of time, but I wanted to give Garrett just a 30 second response of what do, do these three new charter schools uh, in West Virginia mean for West Virginia students and what's down the pike? So uh, just 30 seconds for Garrett. So, 
So I think I think people should be excited because at the end of the day, whether it's three charter schools or not, people are beginning to understand that there is a different way of doing things. That there is a that there is so many people already have access to opportunity in school choice across the country. People with sufficient economic means have always had access to school choice. So what charter schools really symbolize is an opportunity for those of us that don't have the economic means to, to exercise those options. And so whether charter schools, ESAs, community schools, teacher pay raises, I think these are all great things and they're all symbolic of the recognition and respect for education, but also the, the recognition and respect that we have to place kids at the center of our of our reform minded thinking. Thanks so much, Garrett. All right, I'll turn it back over to Matt. Matt, one last question uh, from the audience. How can we get connected with Reverend Watts? How can we get connected with Garrett and the rest of the Cardinal Institute team and Dignity and Bow? Well, thank you very much, Casey. And thank you so much again to Reverend Watts and Garrett uh, for your comments and your, again, modeling of what I think the future of this conversation needs to be, which is a real comfort with disagreement and different views and trying different things together and um, and having an open mind. And so I'm, I'm encouraged by this um, and I appreciate the uh, the work and time. You can visit dignityunbound.org to learn more about the, the projects that we're supporting both in the U.S. and around the world. And um, you can stay in touch with, uh, you can also go to cardinalinstitute.com um, uh, I don't know if Reverend Watts uh, shares his contact information publicly, but Grace Bible Church is 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 the church that he runs. And um, and if you get in touch with us, we're happy to forward on uh, any any request to get in touch with with Reverend Watts and invite him to uh, res respond if if he wishes. Um, uh, with that, we will again thank Thatch Films and a AJ Skira and Joe Jensen for all their work on this to help bring these voices forward. We're grateful for everyone's attendance and spirited discussion. Till next time, thank you very much. Bye-bye.